On this show, I've discussed movies that are, let's say, not great. And I'm just looking for some enjoyable moments. I've also discussed some real hidden gems or diamonds in the rough that really just need that extra attention or push to be seen and appreciated by more. But not today. Today, I'm going to discuss a movie that I've wanted to discuss since I started on the channel. I can't believe it needs to be defended, but it's truly one of the most divisive movies out there now, even 40 years after its original release. Halloween 3 isn't for everyone. Hell, Joe Bob Briggs, one of my absolute heroes of horror, can't stand it. I, I've got problems with this flick. Two stars, and I'm being generous with the two stars. So Thanks, Starcy, for holding the torch for us. But you take away the Halloween moniker and just call it Season of the Witch, and it's one of the best and bleakest horror movies of the early 1980s. The film itself sits at an interesting time both for horror and its own franchise. 1982 in horror is quietly one of the best years in film history for spooky stuff. The Thing, Creepshow, and Poltergeist are probably the three-headed monster that will be what most people think of when they take a look at what the year's output. And come on, I'm not delusional. Halloween 3 isn't better than any of those three movies, but when you look at the pile of also very good movies that year, stuff like The Entity, Slumber Party Massacre, Visiting Hours, Tenebrae, New York Ripper, Q the Winged Serpent, Friday the 13th Part 3, and a host of others, I'd say Halloween 3 is at or near the top of that pile. It's certainly a black sheep for the horror movies of 1982. Within its own horror series, it's usually either loved or hated without much in between, but put it in the context of 1982, and it was put up against the wall seemingly from the start. John Carpenter, who wasn't crazy about Halloween 2, agreed to be involved in the third entry under a couple of stipulations. He didn't want to direct it like he didn't direct Part 2, having those duties fall to first-time director Rick Rosenthal, and Halloween 3 would be assigned to fellow first-time director Tommy Lee Wallace, who would also touch up Nigel Neal's script with an uncredited Carpenter. The other stipulation, and this one would be a game changer, was that the movie was not to follow the previous entry, with Carpenter having designs that the series should shift over to an anthology format, where each entry would be a separate story that would have nothing to do with the others, particularly Michael Myers. This is pretty ballsy stuff. His slasher contemporaries never thought to do this, as Freddy and Jason would be in front and center until eventually facing off with each other in the early 2000s. The cast and crew make this movie something special. While it isn't expressly a Carpenter joint, it has a lot of those elements. He and Deborah Hill helped produce it, while John and his longtime music collaborator did the score for it, which itself is an underrated selection of music. Carpenter would also help with the script and story elements, but go uncredited, as that aspect was a bit of a mess with Nigel Neal's script getting carved up by producers. Neal wanted a much more unspoken violence, I guess, whereas the producers needed more violence and gore. Hell, we even have Dean Cundy behind the camera doing his usual stellar job with cinematography duties. Tommy Lee Wallace does a good job as a first-time director, and he has his own underrated catalog of horror movies with Fright Night Part 2 and the It miniseries from the 90s. Interestingly enough, Joe Dante was going to direct, but left at the 11th hour to work on the Twilight Zone movie. In front of the camera has a bunch of minor roles, but they're anchored by the portrayals from Tom Atkins, Stacey Nelkin, and Dan O'Hurley. Atkins was a Carpenter regular at this point, with roles in The Fog and Escape from New York, but would also go on to wonderful turns in Night of the Creeps, Two Evil Eyes, and Maniac Cop, with no signs of slowing down at the very young age of 87. Nelkin, who's also active today, would stick mostly to TV projects before and after this, but of course is immortalized by the horror community for this role alone. Finally, there is the film's villain, Connell Cochran, who as it turns out, is a witch. O'Herlihy began acting way back in the 1940s, but would really hit his stride and carve out his lasting fame in the 80s and 90s with his roles in this, Robocop, The Last Starfighter, and a six-episode run on Twin Peaks. With all due respect to Atkins being our hero here, Cochran is the perfect villain. He's charismatic but absolutely ruthless when he has to be, and his speech when he thinks he's won with Atkins' Dr. Chalice captured is something I look forward to every Halloween. The world's going to change tonight, Doctor. I'm glad you to watch it. The movie follows a simple premise that has cataclysmic possibilities. Stonehenge. <laughs> it has a power in it. <laughs> there you are. 
man flees from an unseen assailant who then has to fight him off before being brought to the hospital, spouting insane accusations and being seemingly delirious. Another pursuer comes to the hospital and finishes the job before immolating himself in the car in the hospital parking lot in front of our main hero, Dr. Daniel Chalice. He's a fun hero as he's kind of a womanizing, beer-drinking, distant father. I gotta go. But he also has a drive to find out the truth and is willing to believe what he sees and stop it at all costs. The man's daughter comes to identify her father and things just don't sit right. And I don't know what the hell is going on. Neither Ellie or Daniel want to let it go and follow the clues that lead them to the town of Santa Mira, where the year's most popular Halloween masks are being made, along with an annoying earwig that will live in your brain every Halloween season rent-free. The first watch through is an advertising for a holiday, but upon further watches, it becomes a countdown to something far more sinister. The movie keeps everything tight here in this small town while introducing us to nearly every character we need to follow in the film. The hotel has Rafferty the owner, top silver shamrock salesperson Buddy Kupfer and his family, an angry bulk customer Marge who is killed by the masks when she investigates a little too deep into the tag on the mask. The whole town's vibe is in question, with cars driving around with seemingly no destination, a full-blown surveillance system, and a curfew that is announced over loudspeakers. Things get worse when Dan runs into a bum who complains about Cochran and speaks at a turn, so to speak. Hey, Cochran! Fuck you! Ooh, shh, shh, ah, easy, it's easy. alright, it's alright, don't matter to me. His reward is a quick but awful death where his head is completely removed from his body. The kills so far are visceral and mean, and the film portrays these characters as really having no chance. The gore and special effects are done well between the elder Grimbridge getting his face crushed in the hospital and Marge getting her face blasted with a bug coming out after the fact as some foreshadowing, and the bum's head being ripped clean off. It's alright, it's alright, it don't matter to me. You haven't seen anything yet. I love all the little hints the movie drops too. The song is a countdown to something sinister, and the masks being a focal point even before Marge's death scene confirms they aren't to be messed with. Cochrane's crew being silent, almost Terminator-like in their strength and attitude, and the fact that there were no bones or remains found in the burnt car at the hospital. Even the fact that Cochrane brought everyone in from outside of the town, essentially ruining the workforce that a small town like this depends on. He brought in every damn one of them factory people from the outside. Cochrane makes his second appearance 48 minutes into a 90-minute film and really takes over from here. The group gets a tour of the factory, and damn, these masks are cool. The entire factory is one big playhouse with toys, another good hint at what his workforce consists of. The town effectively shuts down after Dan and Ellie play their cards, with no way to call out and nowhere to go. Ellie is of course kidnapped, Ellie. and Dan makes his way back to the factory. Inside, he finds the creepiest damn animatronic I've ever seen. Seriously, the real hands coming out of the old lady mannequin give me the heebie-jeebies more than most of the rest of the movie. Most of it. Dick Warlock gets a hole punched through his chest. <clears throat> That'll be fine. And we see what the androids are really made of before Dan is taken to final processing. Their inside goo always reminded me of what you pull out of pumpkins when you make a jack-o'-lantern, and that always added yet another one of those nice little touches, intended or not. Cochran finally gets to be evil in the best stretch of the film, where even the music decides to lose hope. These guys stole a part of Stonehenge, and in some of the best dialogue of the film, Cochran explains that it was a sacrificial circle that has power to it, but also says that a magician never reveals all his tricks. I love that, because over-explaining the supernatural aspects to a horror film can get messy. 
Cochran decides to show Dan and the audience what can really happen, and we're left to watch helplessly as Buddy and his family become the final test for Cochran's grand plan. The look on Dan's face as little Buddy's head under the mask gives way to a bucket full of insects, reptiles, and other creepy crawlies. He's both disgusted and fearful at the same time as he sees what awaits the country tonight, including his own kids. Not only does this movie kill a kid, but it does so in an absolutely brutal way. Now that Dan has seen the possible fate of children all over the country, we get a soul-crushing view of kids everywhere wearing these death masks. Another cool touch is director Wallace is the voiceover for the advertising, while Jamie Lee Curtis is the voice of the broadcasts in town. Shades of Escape from New York, where Curtis shows up as another regular in some form. Dan's friend in the morgue figures things out a little too late and suffers the fate of nearly every character with a brutal drill to the head. With 20 minutes left in the movie and nearly every character or witness down, we get one of the great evil monologues of all time. Why, Cochran? Why? Do I need a reason? Do I need a reason? Is one of my favorite bad guy responses, even if he does go deeper into it. But there's a better reason. You don't really know much about Halloween. It was the start of the year in our old Celtic lands, and we'd be waiting in our houses of wattles and clay. The barriers would be down, you see, between the real and the unreal. And the dead might be looking in to sit by our fires of turf. Halloween. The last great one took place 3,000 years ago when the hills ran red. When you ask for a trick or a treat, you better be prepared for a trick if it comes your way. Also, he knows how to pronounce Samhain leagues better than Dr. Loomis. The Festival of Samhain. With a mask on his face and the original Halloween on TV, a cool multiverse nod before it was cool, he at least bids him a happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. The last 15 or so minutes goes by quickly with an escape, a frantic phone call home, some sabotage, and a rescue that turns out to be more than it's worth. About the only issue I have with this movie is when Dan and Ellie sneak by everyone with a mask cart, which in itself is kind of dumb, and Ellie lets Dan kill off all the bad guys because at this point she was already a robot. Oh, e Ellie's a robot now, and in a fun and again disheartening twist. Cochran's amused face and clapping towards a great trick that Dan played on him, even as Stonehenge transports him to the negative zone, is a final standout moment for both O'Hurley and the script. With his last ally dead or turned, the movie has a cool full circle moment with Dan rushing to the same gas station to call the TV companies to get the signal turned off. It's gone live and his kids are in danger, but the stakes are even more immediate as kids wearing the masks show up and are right next to him. With the song blaring, he's able to get two of the stations to halt it, but the third one? Well, happy Halloween. I really do consider this the lost Carpenter film, and the movie holds up even better 40 years on. The story is crisp and light, the characters feel mostly real, and the movie has the guts to kill off nearly everyone, end on an inconclusive note, and not set up a sequel. Scream Factory understood how important the movie is and gave it their patented Blu-ray treatment, and the film is rightfully building momentum like its 1982 neighbor The Thing did many years before. I know it's not the greatest thing to ever be put to celluloid, but it's a great 1980s horror film, and I'm done pretending it's not. Now when I hear people incorrectly saying it's trash, I start to lose it and start screaming, Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it!